In 1952, the British colony of Kenya was thrown into crisis by a gang of freedom fighters called Mau Mau. They vowed to free Kenya from colonialism at any cost. Their name became a byword for savagery because of the way they butchered their victims. You could hear them shouting it as they went in, cut, 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 and they would just slash. Oh, yes, yeah, so they, they would slash anybody. No, I tell me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I tell me, I'm going to do it. 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 Though many Africans would die at the hands of Mau Mau, it was the murder of whites that horrified the outside world. To the British, the uprising was such an outrageous attack on colonialism that it justified any response. And that response, when it came, would be brutal and shocking. In the early 1950s, Kenya shone out as one of the last jewels in Britain's colonial crown. The European settlers farmed Kenya's richest soil in an area that had become known as the White Highlands. Over two generations, they had built themselves a life of luxury. It seemed as if the good life would go on forever. The white settlers lived the English-style life. They had their farms. They had lots of servants serving at table. It all appeared to be terribly rich, terribly posh, and absolutely remote from the life of the ordinary African. The ordinary settler really enjoyed being in Kenya. It was a good life. I mean, let's face it, um, be rather blunt, you could get servants, and um, booze was cheap. The Europeans took the view that they were doing the Africans a great favor by being in Kenya. We were, we're jolly good chaps, you know, and you're, you're very lucky to have us here. They were third or fifth class citizens compared to the Europeans. It wasn't racist, it was just, um, well, um, a fact of life. Britain has brought much good to Kenya. Her standards of living are growing still higher as more of her people learn the lessons that the white man has to teach. But the high life of the Europeans was built on African land and African labor. Poorly paid, unable to vote, and restricted even in the crops they could grow, Africans were beginning to resent white man's rule. <laughs> In the post-war world, the facts of colonial life were changing fast. One by one, African countries were demanding self-rule. Africans who had risked their lives fighting for the British during the war were not prepared to return to the old ways. 1942, Tension between black and white was rising, but white settlers felt themselves immune to changing times. I remember a settler saying to me, 
You young district officers know nothing. We've been here for years. We know our boys, as they used to call them. We know the boys. We know all about them. You don't know anything. And it was a difference between knowing. The settler did know a lot. He did know a lot about Africans, how to handle African labour, how to use African labour. But he could not see what the use of that labour and the production of money was beginning to bring about. He couldn't see the political change. The settlers seem complacent and dismissive of African aspiration. Their government, too, refused to take black political ambition seriously. The colonial government was always negative. The African was said to be not ready for independence. He was said to be illiterate and unorganized and things like that. Political frustration was rising fast. In early 1950, African nationalism began to take a new and ominous course. I was on safari. I was in my tent. And just about dawn, there was a clamour, and someone rushed in and said, Buana, Buana, come. Uh, the preacher at the church has been murdered. And I, w I went, it was only a short distance, and lo and behold, the, the preacher had been cut up with a machete, and uh, they'd also killed a goat, taken the sexual organs of the goat and draped it upon the crucifix on the altar of this church. Very nasty business indeed. That was the very first death that I saw. And then more and more came along. Rumours began to circulate about a secret society that had formed amongst the Kikuyu. One fifth of the population, they were Kenya's largest tribe. This mysterious organisation called itself the Land Freedom Army. It was forcing Kikuyu to swear an oath to take back the land the white man had stolen. Any African who refused the oath or remained loyal to the colonialists was likely to be brutally murdered. This secret society soon acquired a new name, though no one knew where from. It was called Mau Mau. Some of the missionaries started to get a bit uneasy and the chiefs also started to get uneasy and they said, do you know, a few people have disappeared and so-and-so was murdered the other night. And we got more and more reports of deaths. And then, when we tried to make general inquiries for the first time, we got a slowing down in information. Unease turned to fear when, on the 7th of October 1952, a staunch British loyalist, Chief Waruhu, was shot by the Mau Mau in broad daylight. The assassination was seen as a declaration of war by the terrorists. Mau Mau was emerging as the first violent threat to British colonial authority in post-war Africa. The government moved fast to stamp it out. Two weeks later, on the 20th of October, the colony's governor, Sir Evelyn Baring, declared a state of emergency. Within days, Kenya, Britain's beloved colonial jewel, was at war with its own subjects. Troops are in the streets of Nairobi. Sir Evelyn Baring, the governor, salutes the men of the Lancashire Fusiliers who have flown in to help clear his colony of the Mau Mau menace, which has struck fear into Kenya's very heart. The government's first step was to arrest the man fast emerging as the most influential and charismatic political figure since Gandhi. His name was Jomo Kenyatta. Kenyatta was the leader of the Kenya Africa Union a political party demanding greater African self-rule. Publicly, he had denounced Mau Mau and the use of violence, but the British believed they had reason to fear him. The British and the white settlers were together convinced that Kenyatta was the brains behind the movement. Everybody knew that he exercised an extraordinary moral influence over Kikuyu opinion they increasingly felt that the degree of organized resistance amongst Kikuyu young men had to be organized from a center and the only center they could imagine was that of Kenyatta and his moderate politicians. They couldn't get the evidence. 
but the government didn't let lack of evidence stand in their way. In a trial mired in controversy, the judge was paid £20,000 to take the case, and the key witness was rewarded with a university course in the UK and the promise of a government post on his return to Kenya. Kenyatta was found guilty of inciting Mau Mau and imprisoned in a remote part of Kenya for the seven years of the emergency. It was meant to wipe him from Kikuyu consciousness. It was a fatal mistake. At a stroke, he became a martyr to the Mau Mau cause, and the British lost the one moderate leader who had the power to unite Kenya. Nairobi police have been supplemented by hundreds of civilians, many of them women, to help round up the Mau Mau bandits. Radio-controlled cars with armoured vehicles are used to carry out the army's plans for bringing in all suspects. As the war against Mau Mau intensified, white settlers rushed to join the security forces. British and African troops poured into the country. Now all Kikuyu were treated as suspects. You were a Kikuyu, you just had to squat and raise your hands or, or bend down, look down and... Uh, answer funny questions from people, strange people. It was a frightening experience. Within 10 days of the emergency, almost 4,000 Africans had been arrested. But Mau Mau attacks continued, and now whites were the target. The Mau Mau slashed their victims with large field knives called pangas. In Tamal, there was a retired British Army major who lived alone uh, on a small holding and he was often warned about his security and, and I don't think he took an awful lot of notice of it. He thought that he knew these people well, he'd been living there for years. And of course one night he left his door open and his cook or somebody else in his employ let a gang in and they pangered him to death and he was just lying there in the living room absolutely slaughtered. As fear spread through the white community, settlers began arming themselves. I had a Sten gun with two barrels uh, taped together and a 4.5 revolver. And I slept in my clothes with gym shoes on. And I had a, a plan, if, if um, uh, the house was broken into, what, what I should do. The settlers' worst fear was an attack in the night by their own Kikuyu servants who had taken the Mau Mau Oath. Isolated farms were in the greatest danger. Several of the murders which took place in, in uh, isolated European homes took place in the evening. When the, the staff brought your soup in, they would have to come into the house through the back door and therefore this was the time when often the Mama would choose to come in behind them, having intimidated them, or sometimes they might have even been sympathetic to the movement, and then they would come in and attack while the people were sitting having dinner. You didn't really know who you could trust, and so right from an early age of 14, I had to carry a gun when I went out on the farm. When things were particularly tense, I actually had to go with two armed men with me. And then, of course, we had the, the weapons with us at all times, in the house, under the pillow, beside the soup plate in, in the evening, at dinner. It was just something that you had with you all the time. As the tension increased, farms everywhere were turned into fortresses. Our own security arrangements here consisted mainly of, a, of, of what we called a home guard post. Um, which was just out the back of our farm where we had 40 armed men in, in kind of like a, a western fort. It was very dramatically built with trenches and, and a drawbridge and was pretty secure. Most of them had shotguns. Those that were not able to have firearms had bows and arrows. It was all fairly rudimentary, but um, at least having 40 armed men around the place in day and night was kind of a bit of an encouragement to us. Any encouragement the settlers might have felt in the early weeks of the emergency was dashed in January 1953 with news of a horrifying murder that rocked the white community. Mr and Mrs Ruck and their small son uh, ran a farm on, on the Kinnercop 
and uh, he, he was a farmer, and his wife, Esme, who I actually knew well as a child, she, she was a doctor, a lovely person. One evening, Ruck was lured out and, and chopped to pieces, and Esme, his wife, hearing this commotion outside, rushed out to help him. She then was killed. The little boy who'd hidden up in a bedroom in a cupboard was sought out and cut to pieces himself. Having seen some of these sites, it, uh, it, it did have a, a quite a traumatic effect on one. Uh, I think one was always very, very scared of a swinging knife for a start, but the sight of so much blood and people just lying there innocent people who had really just been torn limb from limb. It, it was really, yes, quite shocking. The horrific nature of these murders sealed the fate of the Mau Mau. Angry settlers stormed Government House, demanding stronger action. The deaths were brutal, but in truth, during the whole emergency, more white settlers would die on the roads than at the hands of the terrorists. Yet this didn't stop the war against Mau Mau turning into one of the bloodiest horror stories of the British Empire. The Mau Mau uprising in Kenya sent shockwaves through the colony. Though it was an outrageous attack on the white community and on colonial authority, in truth it was the Africans themselves who would suffer the most. Kikuyu, who remained loyal to the colonial government, were increasingly under threat. On the 26th of March, 1953, a Mau Mau gang waited for dusk to fall on the loyalist village of Lari. The village chief, Chief Luca, was fiercely loyal to the colonial authorities and had been rewarded with land. He was hated for it by the Mau Mau. But it was the whole village that would pay the price as the gang launched its attack. To the Mau Mau, Lari was a fight about loyalty and land. But to the British, it was simply a savage massacre of innocent Kikuyu. From now on, Mau Mau would never be seen as anything but cruel thugs. The horror of that night would eclipse their political ambitions forever. Upon the children, too, the Mau Mau had laid its evil mark. The lucky ones, I wonder.
The Mau Mau's bloodthirsty reputation began to obsess the British imagination. They couldn't see Mau Mau as a force for black progress. To them, it was a primitive attack against the white man and the benevolent advancement he brought. They saw the savagery as partly a welling up of an old unreconstructed Africa, which had not yet received sufficient colonial enlightenment and discipline, and which in a sense proved that colonialism still had a job to do. To the British, the oaths of allegiance that new recruits would swear were conclusive evidence of Mau Mau's primitive nature. Initiates would be bound to the oath through rituals using symbols of importance in Kikuyu culture, such as goat's meat and blood. In a way, they were doing no more than a British military recruit would do in, in swearing on the Bible to uh, obey orders and, and uh, to be loyal to the Queen. Uh, but the, the cultural symbols which were involved, of course, were totally alien to white perspectives. It was seen to be bestial. Colonial reports of the secret oaths became fixated with them as a source of black magic and bestiality. It was effective propaganda and helpful in motivating British troops. We were all soldiers who, whose job it is to fight the Queen's enemies and it, it was clear to us on the briefings that we were given that this was a major force for evil and that we were there to take it out, to deal with it. Mau Mau gangs had their base camps hidden deep inside the dense forests of Mount Kenya and the Aberdares. But British troops were slow to adapt to the terrain. The Mau Mau were extremely difficult to get to grips with in the forest. Their local knowledge was excellent. They were used to living very rough. We were impressed by their field craft, their ability to melt away when we approached. Haya, Johnny Kizakali, Netua Menyaga, Tondua Quigaria, the Garasia Nunga, Nakuigita and Johnny. Kuigua <laughs> Nabuava, the Ricali Mueno, who quo were Nitua Menega and Johnny Eku, Kanae Murimori, and it is in Ajatogikirak. They smelt awful. Um, that sounds a curious comment. Uh, we revolted them because we, apparently to them, the European smells of soap. Um, they revolted us because they never had a bath um, or, or a proper wash and they, they, they stank. The Mau Mau's bush skills were little help outside the forests. Armed with nothing but homemade guns and panga knives, they were a weak enemy compared to the troops mobilized against them. But still, the British military responded with the full force of a colonial power. The forests were bombed and became the main hunting ground for Mau Mau. The forests and a one-mile strip around them were declared prohibited areas. Any African living nearby was in danger. When we saw an African in the forest, or within the one-mile strip outside the edge of the forest, we were instructed to treat this African as a mama. 
And so it was, shoot on sight is a fair way of, of describing it. Nobody knew how many Kikuyu had taken the Mau Mau Oath. To most soldiers and police, all Kikuyu were potential enemies. You get these young soldiers coming in, they're pitch pulled into a situation where there's a mass of black people. They cannot differentiate between one black man and another. They don't even see the skin colors. They can't tell one tribe from another. The officers are trained for battle situations when you go forth with your platoon or your company and you do something. Well, there's precious little for them to do, precious little for them to attack, and soldiers get bored. Without knowing who was the enemy and who was not, some soldiers and police began taking the law into their own hands. Reports of brutality by the security forces began to appear in the British press. One newspaper carried a story describing a gruesome method by which British troops kept a record of their Mau Mau kills. Na makauraga kandu mnoenjo ni makama muzira na kwa ni kumuti tole makamuraga makamurenga njara makazina njara isi kini detuwe figansi kini detuwe irole. Netwa shoka vi kauti kumenyole ya vee karide tuka koreria nenga niya wetu uradilwe na alengu wa njara. Dugu shio tutia tinda na gira nake no shio tungi koreria mura gira tae murenge njara a year into the emergency, more shocking stories about troop brutality began to surface. In November 1953, Captain Gerald Griffiths of the King's African Rifles hit the headlines in Britain when in the course of his court-martial for murdering an African worker, he admitted to paying his men five shillings a head for every Mau Mau they killed. A witness at the trial said he was told by Griffiths he could shoot anybody he liked so long as they were black, because Griffiths wanted to increase his company's score of kills to 50. Certainly, uh, my own regiment, for example, when we got going the commanding officer offered a cash prize to the first patrol to kill a Mau Mau. The same sort of thing had been done in, in Malaya, and it was, uh, it was of course, um, an incentive. The practice was written up in the regimental records, and the story soon found its way to the House of Commons and the British press. I was sent home on a course about halfway through our time in Kenya and I was at home in, in Tynmouth in, in Devon and um, about the time I was there there was a great headline in the newspaper, is your son in the Devons, if so is he a murderer? And uh, people who I thought were really good old friends w w w were distinctly chilly with me. The British military commander-in-chief, General George Erskine, was appalled by what he called the breach of discipline among the forces. He sent round a stern memo, warning them to clean up their act. I think probably going into the forest and, and shooting natives of what to an extent was a host country um, was a little bit offside. But the real battle against Mau Mau was not fought in the forests. It was a struggle for hearts and minds. In late 1953, the British began a new campaign to cut the Mau Mau off from their supporters. In towns and villages, Kikuyu were rounded up by the government and divided into loyal and disloyal. The first target was Nairobi, believed to be the center of Mau Mau organization. A ruthless operation to clear the city of suspect Kikuyu was put into action. It was called Operation Anvil. You woke up in the morning and the whole estate was kind of surrounded by 
soldiers with guns, and people were herded to uh, small areas without knowing what is happening. They were not guilty of anything. They just had to be taken away and, 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 and removed. Whether you were innocent or not, you had to go. By the end of Operation Anvil, more than 30,000 Kikuyu had been swept out of the city and sent to holding camps, regardless of their allegiance. This policy punished the entire Kikuyu tribe for the sins of a minority. In the roundups, families were separated. Men were taken to the camps. Women and children were forced onto the overcrowded native reserves. In rural areas, Kikuyu were pushed into specially built fortified villages where they lived under 23-hour curfew. This policy, known as villagization, gave the colonial authorities total control over the tribe. The government portrayed it as purely protective and beneficial for the Africans. During the emergency, the Kikuyu were concentrated into villages as a protection against Mau Mau and quickly recognized the advantages of this organization. Villagization was anathema to the Kikuyu. The Kikuyu live on farms, they love farms, they love their land, and to push them into a village was to destroy, to destroy a whole part of their culture. The villages were controlled by the Home Guard, local police forces made up of Kikuyu loyal to the British. Divide and rule of the tribe became an effective weapon in the campaign. To aid them in their struggle, hundreds of loyal Africans, among them men of the Kikuyu tribe, keep constant guard. As the British government continued its technique of reward and punishment, the Kikuyu tribe was split. Loyalists paid a higher and higher price for their allegiance. Itumikia the Mau Mau had earned their reputation for violence, but in the face of such determined rebellion, it was the British who would finally take the brutality one step too far. The gift of civilization had always been invoked to justify rule over the black man. But in wiping the colony clean of Mau Mau, the British used methods that were anything but civilized. Emergency law was rough justice. It became a capital offense to take a Mau Mau oath, or even to be seen with anyone carrying a gun. Between 1953 and 1956, more than a thousand Africans were hanged for alleged Mau Mau crimes. Public hanging had been outlawed in Britain for over a century, but in Kenya, it was used to keep the rest of the population in line. When somebody did have to hang for uh, their Mama crimes, then uh, the British felt that the Kikuyu should not only have justice done to them, but should see that justice was done. There was a, a mobile gallows. The actual drop was, of course, screened off, but one could see or at least imagine the Mama convict mounting the staircase to uh, the platform and presumably uh, one could hear the drop. Dead Mama 
particularly Mau Mau commanders, uh, were displayed um, at crossroads, at marketplaces, at administrative centres, uh, to uh, demonstrate uh, that um, if you fought against the British, you, you could meet a sticky end. Many more thousands were held in detention camps on suspicion of being Mau Mau. During the emergency, the camps held more than 80,000. In 1954, one third of all Kikuyu men were said to be in prison at any one time. These detainees had not been convicted of any crime and were held without trial. The government was still obsessed with the power of the Mau Mau Oath. They believed that any Kikuyu still bound by it would be a danger to the stability of the colony. Every prisoner had to denounce the oath and submit to a cleansing ceremony. A lot of pressure was put on uh, me and other people to confess the oath, uh, which of course uh, we denied. It was very dehumanizing. You were made to feel you were nothing. You were being whipped and kind of walking, uh, you made to run on your knees, uh, literally. Uh, you had to crawl until you sweat. Then you were made to stand for uh, sometimes overnight under very heavy light. You had to be pushed and knocked around and um, frightened in so much that uh, people had even to admit uh, what was not true. By 1956, the camps held 20,000 detainees who still refused to confess that they had taken an oath. As a fighting force, Mama had been defeated, but the logjam of suspects meant that the emergency could not be brought to an end. London demanded that some way be found to speed up the process of cleansing detainees of their oaths. The way that it found was if you beat them up enough, then they'll confess an oath. So what you do is you beat them up and then you give them a bit of paper and a piece of pen pencil and say, confess, I took it, I took it, I took it. You are now a human being again. I think sort of Christianity had been tried and, and hadn't succeeded uh, with them. Um, and they, they needed a sort of moral compulsion, I don't know how, how one else could put it really, to uh, confess their oaths. The Mwea camps held 5,000 detainees who were refusing to confess the oath and submit to the rehabilitation process. I was told that I was going to be posted to take over the rehabilitation at the Mwea camps. So I said, no, I don't want to do this. And uh, I was then told you can't say no in a service. You have to, at the very least, go and look at it. So I went to go and have a look at it. There I met Superintendent Cowan. John Cowan was head of the Mwea detention camps. He developed an effective method of extracting confessions. In one of my camps, there was a small faction of uh, Mau Mau detainees who were difficult and um, there was a procedure which was implemented there which was successful. It was a very sort of embryonic procedure. We had to coerce them into confessing. We used a little bit of force on them. They were surrounded by, by elders and by other detainees all pleading with them to confess, shouting at them. It's difficult for them to resist. It was pressure, really, and they, they did confess in the end. Superintendent Cowan explained to me in great detail what he did. And he told me that my fears were totally groundless because all it was, it was just like a good rugger scrum. Uh, there, there might have been hand slapping, possibly an odd fist or two here and there, but, uh, but uh, no more than that. I never saw a man um, in all the time I was there having had force perpetrated on him um, in any worse condition than a, an amateur boxer getting out of a ring. Cowan's method, using what was called compelling force, proved very successful at eliciting confessions. He was asked to write a report on how to deal with a group of hardcore detainees held at a camp called Hola. Now violence was enshrined as official policy. It was here, at Hola, 
that the government's brutality would finally bring the crisis to a tragic end. The Hola prisoners refused to confess the oath or to perform manual labor. They declared themselves political prisoners. <laughs> The Cowan plan outlined a scheme to make the Hola detainees submit to authority. The first thing was to get them to obey work orders. I envisaged the possibility that the detainees wouldn't immediately prove amenable to work, and that if they didn't, they should be in the phrase, manhandled to the site of work and forced to carry out the task. We thought that compelling force might have to be used. Uh, we might have to make them. But they weren't being violent, were they? They were simply refusing no, they to weren't work. No, they weren't being violent, but they were being very insolent. And um, their, their whole demeanor was one of sort of insolence and arrogance and they, they weren't, no one was going to, to do anything with them at all. On the 3rd of March 1959, the camp commandant put Cowan's plan into action. 85 prisoners were marched out to a site and ordered to work. <laughs> When the prisoners refused peacefully to cooperate, the commandant decided to compel the men to work. When the guards stopped, 11 men lay dead and 60 were seriously injured. The district commissioner was called to the scene. So I go up to Hola, where as far as I could see, there were quite a number of corpses on the ground and a lot of others injured writhing about and a whole gaggle of people, black prison officers, prison warders and white prison officers standing around, all not knowing what to do. I realised at once that this was political dynamite. Prison officers claimed the detainees had died drinking contaminated water from a tank. The story found its way back to London. The Labour MP Barbara Castle had been monitoring reports of British brutality throughout the Mau Mau crisis. She was sceptical when she read the first reports of Hola. The story appeared in the press that 11 Africans had died. But the explanation given by the Europeans in control of the camp was they died drinking water from a water cart. 
Well, I mean, I could, I could guess what a, uh, that another cover-up was taking place, but I felt pretty helpless. But the true story of the prisoners' deaths could not be kept quiet. The corpses had to be got rid of. We had to fly them out in a, in a, in a plane from our dirt airstrip. They had to be flown to Melindi, which was the nearest place where, again, it's all publicity, you see. The news had got out. Corpses were being flown in from Hola, where they'd been beaten up. An incident that had appalled people on the ground caused an uproar in Britain. The Cowan plan, with its instructions to manhandle the prisoners, came under fire. I didn't feel guilty, I don't think. I don't think that's, that's quite the word. I felt obviously very sorry indeed and great regret that 11 men had, had died and 60-odd uh, had been, had been uh, injured. I'm sorry that I didn't uh, modify that particular phrase that I used, but I, didn't, I, I think that was, uh, couldn't have been foreseen. I didn't feel guilty that the procedure had gone wrong. I felt extremely sorry that it had gone wrong, but, but not actually, actually guilty. For the first time, the full horror of what had been happening in Kenya was revealed to a shocked public. Suddenly, it was the British authorities who looked like brutal thugs. In the House of Commons, the scandal brought condemnation from all sides. I went into the house. I was so trembling with rage. I could barely get the words out. It was a packed house of commons. And I was followed immediately by Enoch Powell in his very uh, clipped, upright, uh, business-like tones, with no emotion in it, but uh, also tearing the cover-up case apart brilliantly. Facing political disaster, the Tories rushed to repair the damage. Within weeks, London stopped the rehabilitation process in the Kenyan camps. The Mau Mau Oath, which had dominated the crisis, suddenly became irrelevant. Everyone was pushed out as fast as possible, whether they'd confessed to taking an oath or not confessed to taking an oath, whether they were still human or subhuman or not human or whatever. And the move to independence via the release of Kenyatta, the leader of the Kikuyu and the leader of the movement began to go more and more quickly. The scandal of Hola highlighted the Africans' political aspirations, but it also revealed the hypocrisy of a colonial power that tried to civilize its African subjects with brutality. They weren't animals, they weren't this, that and the other. What they were doing was fighting a political fight for their freedom and Hola eventually gave it to them. The emergency that had cost the lives of 32 settlers and 11,500 Mau Mau was over. For Britain, Hola brought the Mau Mau crisis and her romance with Kenya to a shameful end. It's hard to believe that that could have happened under a British colonial administration, but it did. And it followed us. It was in a period of, inc of insensitivity uh, to the fact that these Africans were human beings that were going to develop and demand the right to develop and to rule themselves. In 1963, only four years after the Hola massacre, Kenya was granted independence. Jomo Kenyatta, freed from prison, became the country's first president. The men and women who had been cast as savages were free to run their own country. Joining the celebrations were the last die-hard Mau Mau, who had always vowed to stay in the forests until the day Kenya was free. For more information on the story covered in tonight's program, go to the Secret History website at www.channel4.com.